Hello, and greetings from Baltimore, Maryland, the home of the Peabody Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. My name is Abra Bush, and I'm the Senior Associate Dean of Institute Studies at Peabody. I am absolutely delighted you could join us today for Technology to Teach Ear Training Remotely, the second um, in, I'm, I'm so sorry, the fourth in our series of nine Summer Lunch and Learn series events focused on the challenges and opportunities of remote instruction for music. A special thanks goes to the academic leadership at many of the conservatories and schools of music in the United States and the United Kingdom for their support for this series. They graciously supported my idea for this work and recommended a list of presenters who do excellent work in the area of remote and online pedagogy. Before we get started, I'd also like to thank four Peabody staff members who are joining us today. Joseph Montcalmo is Peabody's Director of Academic Technology and Instructional Design, where he leads an incredible team of staff involved in every aspect of academic technology and online learning. Joe is here to advise on matters related to pedagogy, synchronous and asynchronous instruction, and any other technological applications. Adam Scalici from Peabody's production team will be in the background monitoring the webinar and working through any technical challenges we may have. Please send comments or concerns about technology related to this webinar directly to Adam in the chat. Patrick Wallen from the Dean's Office will provide any additional support. And finally, Christina Mancior and Robin McGinnis from Peabody's Launchpad are here to help me curate your questions. A very special thank you to all of them. A few notes before we begin. I see many of you are already hopping into the chat to say hello. Please do that. Hop in, say hello, tell us where you're from, but please make sure that it indicates that it's to all the panelists and attendees so that we can see where you're from. We hope you'll consider this an interactive session. The presenters will spend a total of about 20 to 30 minutes for their presentations, after which we'll reserve the remainder of the time for questions and comments from you. Please place your questions in the Q&A area of the webinar so that we can curate those questions and ask them of the presenters. Should you have any technical difficulties, again, Adam's your guy, he'll be monitoring that chat. And finally, the presenters have agreed to permit us to record this webinar. The session, as well as their slides, will be posted to the Peabody Keep Teaching website within one to two days, should you wish to refer to them again or share them with any of your colleagues. And now, I am very pleased to welcome our guest presenters for today. Dr. Janine Brown is an Assistant Professor of Music Theory at the Peabody Conservatory of the Johns Hopkins University. And Dr. Gary Karpinski is professor of music at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Their full biographies may be found on the Peabody Keep Teaching website. One last reminder that those questions go into the Q&A and please help us with any questions that you may have. And now Janine Brown will take it away. Hi everyone. It's really great to know that so many wonderful friends and colleagues are in on this call. And thanks to Dean Bush for the opportunity to speak and also to Dr. Karpinski. I'm just so honored to be speaking with you. Here's an outline of today's session. I'm first gonna talk about ways to assess singing online. I'll also describe how I'm incorporating group singing exercises online and how I'm trying to carry over the deeply personal and beautiful moments of face-to-face -face ear training into an online environment. Dr. Karpinski will then talk about teaching and assessing listening skills online. And I know that some of you already do the types of activities that I'll describe, and I'm looking forward to learning from you all in the question and answer period at the end. Here is a brief snapshot on how my ear training classes used to work in person so that you understand where I'm coming from. Students at Peabody came to class every day, Monday through Friday, for a short 25-minute class. Classes consisted of introducing content, group singing, dictation exercises. So for example, on Monday, I'd introduce the concept of augmented six chords, we'd listen to some music with these chords, and we'd do a singing warm up with the augmented six. On Tuesday, we'd sing some melodies in unison and some duets with the augmented six from chapter 19 in Rogers Ottman, which is our text. On Wednesday, we do a harmonic dictation with augmented six chords. On Thursday, we do a melodic dictation with the augmented six leap. And so essentially, there's always one reigning topic per week. And all of these in-class activities kept us really busy, experiencing a topic in many modalities. 
In fact, this really inhibited my ability to use class time to grade sight singing activities. I found that assessment of individual singing was not an effective use of class time, which is one of many reasons that I stopped grading students in class for singing. I was also respecting disability accommodations, student stress, and also that it's not really sight singing if you just heard your neighbor sing the same melody. So even prior to COVID-19, I assessed students singing outside of the classroom. And there were three weekly singing assignments where each assignment was on the same topic, say the augmented six, but each assignment type was different. And I'll continue to give assignments in this way if we do stay online in the fall. Two of these weekly assignments were prepared, meaning that students knew in advance which exercise they were going to have to sing, and they had a lot of time to practice it before the due date. Other assignments were at site activities, meaning that they would only have 30 seconds or less or so to look at a melody before singing it for a grade. So let's first talk about the prepared singing assignments. Once a week, students were asked to make a video of themselves singing an exercise from our book. In that video, I needed to see the student's face and their conducting arm. They were also not allowed to wear headphones for various reasons, one being that they could be listening to the melody while singing at the same time. What's great about these videos is that students could record them over and over and over again, and they can scrutinize their own performance before uploading the video for a grade by the due date. It teaches them to critically analyze their own singing. And then when I would grade the students in Blackboard, I can say something like, okay, in measure 12, beat four, or 52 seconds into the video, you were flat, you sang the wrong syllable, etc." And they can go back in and listen to that moment themselves. If they sang in class, live, or even in Zoom, there may not be a recording of their performance for them to re-listen to, and they may not remember what they did wrong or right. Another type of weekly prepared assignment is a melody that I'd have them sing in Smart Music, an online program that can assess a student's pitch and rhythm. I use this program primarily because one of the big challenges of teaching sight singing is that some students just don't know when they're right or wrong. I can give them this feedback in class, of course, but outside of class, what are their options? They could work at a piano, although sometimes this doesn't even work for the weakest students. They can work with a tutor, although tutors aren't always available. So I use smart, smart music as a way for students to receive immediate feedback on singing a particular melody. I've composed weekly assignments for students to sing that are related to the topic of the week. So if the topic is augmented six chords, I would compose a melody with a leap of an augmented six that students would sing in smart music. You can upload these melodies as XML files right to smart music. And then when uh, students sing the melody, they're given precise feedback, which notes and rhythms are right and wrong, and smart music gives them an automatic grade on how they did. We can call these untimed assignments, where students can take as much time as they want to re-record themselves singing to get a better and better grade, and then they can select their best score and upload it by the due date. Truthfully, it took me about a year to compose melodies tailored to all of our weekly pedagogical topics and put them into smart music, but it was really worth the effort. Instead of composing melodies yourself, though, you could use some of the wonderful pre-composed melodies that are already in smart music. Uh, you could take a look at the materials that Cynthia Gonzalez has put in smart music and use those as assignments. Many of them are perfect for freshman sight singing and that's just her first volume of materials that she's uploaded so far. One thing to note is that smart music just records audio. It doesn't grade syllables and conducting, which is why it's also nice to also have students submitting a video once a week where syllables and conducting are factors in the grading if that matters to you. I should also take this moment to say that smart music used to be kind of the only tool of its kind, but you might check out Sight Reading Factory or Ear Master. Even Note Flight has a new tool called Sound Check that's coming out soon, and they have an introductory webinar this Thursday, June 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern that you could check out. It's supposed to be uh, very similar to smart music, and links to all of these tools are at the end of my presentation. The point though, is that using one of these tools gives students the opportunity to receive immediate feedback on their sight singing at all hours of the day when you're not there to do so. 
If you're unfamiliar, this is what smart music looks like. What you see is a melody that I composed for my freshmen to sing. And uh, one of my students sang this melody for a grade. Green notes are the notes that they sang correctly. Red notes are the ones that they got wrong. And yellow notes are the ones that they, they sang the right note, but they were, uh, it was performed late. And this student uh, earned a score of 57%, which is shown in the upper left corner of the figure. Okay. Testing a student's ability to sing a melody at sight is another type of weekly assignment that I give. And during the pandemic, I would meet with students in Zoom for their individual exams, where I would share my screen and ask them to sing a short melody that they had never seen before that I had displaying on my screen. And after they sang, it was really nice, frankly, to chat with students individually, hear how they've been doing. I could give them tailored pointers on how they can improve. And maybe they talked with me more one on one than they would have if their other classmates were in on the zoom call. I don't know. We can also make use of smart music to help students prepare for these individual exams. Uh, it has a feature where the instructor can decide uh, whether they want the students to have anywhere between 15 seconds up to two minutes to practice a melody before the program will automatically count the student in at the tempo that you decide and then record and grade whatever they sang. You can imagine that some students reported this experience to be very stressful. For example, if a student sang the melody correctly, but just one half step too low, smart music would give them a zero. And of course, you could go back in and override the grade that smart music gave. Uh, but overall, I still think that smart music offers a way for students to receive immediate feedback on their sight singing skills. Now, if you don't want to use smart music, you can instead mimic this type of timed experience by using another sight singing program or even a timed quiz in Blackboard or your own LMS, where you give students only a few minutes to study a melody, record yourself singing it, and then upload the recording. All right, group singing was always a wonderful and ungraded feature of every class. The students and I loved it. We always sang together and that simply doesn't work in Zoom. Although truthfully, I haven't tried cleanfeed.net, Jamkazam, Soundjack, or these other apps that are said to improve synchronous performance in Zoom. But if we are going to be online in the fall though, I plan for group singing activities to be asynchronous for a bunch of different reasons. And so I need to think about new ways to incorporate ensemble and multi-part singing online for a grade because students will no longer get this in-class experience. So here's my plan. One option is for students to be watching a video of me singing one part of a duet and then students record themselves listening to my part while singing the other part of the duet and then submitting that for an assignment. A second option is to ask students to record a video of themselves singing the treble part of a duet while listening to themselves singing the bass part that they had pre-recorded. This is definitely a more tech, uh, a more low tech option than having students record the two parts and then assemble them together in Audacity or GarageBand. But there are benefits to videos. You can see the student's face, their conducting arm, and then there's also no tech really to teach to the students. You could also have students play one part on their instrument while solfeging another part with their voice, both recorded at different times, of course. Um, and you could even have them solfege along with a well-known recording of some other soloist or ensemble. There are so many options. Uh, for my sophomores, when my sophomores are learning the C clefs, I'm going to have them sing all four parts of a Bach chorale and open score, and then to merge the recordings together. And other options, of course, include pairing students together, having them record different parts of a piece, which has its own sets of benefits and challenges. Okay, some final in important considerations. First, online course development takes a long time. And I say this not to discourage any of you, but because it's true. For example, even before you start looking at online tools and creating materials, you have to know the structure of your class. What are your end goals? What are your weekly topics to get there? How often are your assignments? And so on. Second, it's important to address that ear training is a deeply personal class. It's why I love it. We're asking students to investigate the limits of their ear training skills and tackle those limits head on or ear on. This journey is different for each student. 
Another reason why my class is personal is that we listen to music and we discuss what it is about what we're hearing that makes us get chills when we listen to it. It might be due to mode mixture as we'll discuss in the sophomore year, or maybe there's a beautiful depositura as we discuss in the freshman year. We listen to these moments without the help of a musical score and we investigate from a, musical from a music theoretical perspective in relation to our emotional response to the music. These moments are my favorite part of class and they might be for my students too. And I'm challenging myself to incorporate these moments into an online setting. For example, in a weekly assignment, I plan to have students write analytically about what they hear and connect it up with their emotions about a particular excerpt. Maybe this will work even better online than it did in person as students might open up and they might talk more online about what they're hearing because they'll be able to re-listen to the piece to digest it rather than having me lead them through the discussion in, in a short 25 minute class. Overall, I think it's best just to let go of trying to translate a face-to-face -face class one-to-one -one into the online setting and instead challenge ourselves to embrace what online teaching offers. I'm trying to be creative and adaptive for better or worse. Finally, here's a list of tools that I've touched upon in this presentation. I didn't describe the SingScope app, which is at the bottom of the slide. It's a tool that can help improve student, students' intonation when the instructor isn't there to provide feedback. Um, and I can talk about it at the end, or um, I have a review coming out about it in the next issue of College Music Symposium. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Karpinski. Please reach out over email if you'd like. My email is at the top of the slide here. And thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you, Janine. Um, I think what I'll do is I will uh, share my screen so everyone can see what I'm talking about here. So give me just a moment to do this. And I hope that everybody can see what I've got on the screen right now. So first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Bush for inviting me to participate today. I really appreciate the opportunity, and these are important times, and I think this is a good opportunity for all of us to share what we're learning. Um, let's think about the typical oral skills class. Um, in addition to the sight singing stuff that uh, Dr. Brown has talked about, um, we often think about oral skills students as being hunkered over their desks, scribbling away at dictation, and it's a very, very typical kind of experience that we see in these classes. And indeed, dictation is the one listening skill that's mentioned as a requirement in the NASM handbook. But there are many types of listening skills that be can, can be developed in oral skills classes. For example, there are things like pulse graphs, um, these are the kinds of things that we do with students in beginning days when they're learning to uh, hear and understand meter in a more sophisticated way than just simply slapping down a meter sign. Uh, or when we get to more advanced levels like this when they're working with a, uh, an excerpt from Bartok. That's the student's work from this past semester. Um, but there are also very simple, straightforward things like proto-notation that I've used throughout my uh, research over the past decades. This is, uh, I find a very, very good diagnostic tool to get at what students are hearing, remembering, and understanding. And that's a different kind of task from simply taking dictation. Uh, but um, dictation, of course, is another kind of, of task. Uh, and transcriptions which are longer than dictations and can be listened to many times. We'll talk about the distinctions between dictation and transcription uh, in greater detail in a few moments. There are other activities such as hypermetric graphs, form maps, and so on. For good reasons beyond the scope of my brief talk today, um, dictation and transcription form the lion's share of activities in oral skills courses. So let's talk about what can be done remotely. Dictation must be played in real time, so-called asynchronously. So there can be difficulties delivering dictation that I'll talk about in greater detail in a few moments. Transcription, on the other hand, can be delivered asynchronously via sound file posted online, transmitted via email, and so on. And the temptation then is to simply say, let's let transcription and other untimed activities replace dictation. But what I'd like to do now is I'd like to compare dictation and transcription and talk about why they're distinct activities and both of them are important. 
First of all, dictation is controlled by the instructor. A specific number of playings occur, time limit is set after each playing, and each listening is experienced in toto. It's a kind of uh, holistic uh, listening uh, environment. We compare that to transcription, that's controlled by the student. There are an unlimited number of playings over a period of time. So if you give a transcription assignment over a day or a week or whatever, the student can take as much time as they have available in order to, uh, to listen as many times as they want. Uh, there's no time limit uh, after each playing. Uh, and uh, recordings may be stopped and started midway, which is very different from listening to, say, phrase length dictations and have to uh, do that listening in situ. So in general, dictation more closely models the real world experience of listening to music as it happens in real time. Studio teachers, chamber coaches, conductors, and so on, indeed most listeners in general, cannot ask performers to stop and repeat things many times just for the sake of listening. And in this way, this models the kind of error detection that's one of the goals of both ear training and sight singing uh, study. Uh, and, and it was interesting, there was a study that was done uh, oh, a couple decades ago uh, by folks at uh, Huddersfield Polytechnic where they surveyed graduates who were say five and ten years out from music programs and the single most important thing they said that they learned in music school was error detection, the ability to determine the difference between what's on the printed page and what they're actually hearing in real time and that can't be done by asking someone to go back and say make a mistake over again. So it's important that this kind of real-time listening to, to take place. So what are the pedagogical consequences of replacing dictation with transcription, which as I said is the temptation in these times of remote uh, learning? Well, let's go through quickly a summary of what transpires while, while taking dictation. I've spilled a lot of ink uh, on this over the years, but I'll just very quickly kind of give a summary here. Um, in order to be able to take dictation, uh, listeners need to be able to focus their attention on what they hear. Uh, and that then needs to fall into their short-term melodic memory. And there are at least two aspects of this. One is simply, can they remember what they've heard? But also, just as important, something I've dubbed extractive memory. Um, where listeners will hear something in a larger context, say a phrase with you know 19 notes in it, and be able to remember, say, six, eight, ten pitches from that. That kind of focused uh, attention and short-term extractive memory is very, very important. Uh, it, we use it all the time uh, as musicians. Um, after that, then whatever is in a listener's memory must fall into the understanding phase. Uh, so that, for example, if a listener hears a passage, they might say, Oh, I hear that that's a two beat note uh, followed by a two half beat notes followed by a triplet and the scale degrees were say three, four, five, one raised one and two and so on. Um, all of that's done in understanding without regard to uh, a, a particular clef key meter and so on. And then finally, uh, they must be able to notate uh, what they hear. And uh, that involves then translating what they've heard, remembered, and understood into a particular key clef meter and so on. Um, so all of that's important. And taking transcription obviates some of this. So for example, focused attention is much less important. Um, it's just not as important for a listener uh, to be able to focus their attention on precious listenings when they can repeat something over and over again. Uh, the same thing goes for short-term melodic memory and especially that extractive memory when a listener can stop a recording partway and just listen to a few pitches and try to write something down um, that doesn't build up their skill to be able to hear something and extract um, uh, context from, from, from what they're hearing. Um, and even the understanding phase, I used to say that it was just focused attention and short-term melodic memory that, that were different in um, transcription, but I, I'm coming to understand that even the understanding phase uh, can get corrupted uh, and, and is not quite as important for some students depending upon how they work. And so I'd like to give you an example of this from an assignment that I gave this past spring. You're seeing the notation here. Uh, from a recorded excerpt that students were provided online and their task was uh, over a, a, a short period 
to write this out in the treble clef starting on G5 in an appropriate meter. And I'd like to call your attention to measure 13 here. This is the interesting part of this passage. We were working on distant modulations at the time. It modulates from G major to E flat major for this short passage here. Uh, and so here's what I got actually from a couple of students in the class. Um, this is one notation of that. And you'll notice what they did with measure 13 in this passage. Um, and harmonically, uh, they identified all the pitches correctly, but you see that functionally things are spelled uh, in an odd way. So instead of uh, uh, pitch class three being an E flat, it's a D sharp, and then followed by D natural and so on. Um, they got all the pitches right. And so I, I asked these two students, I, I, I said, well, how did you work on this? And they said, well, yes, we did work together uh, and we used a piano. Uh, and so what they did in essence was to turn this into a a series of pitch matching tasks. So they got the pitch class of the first note, the pitch class of the second note, and, and they were in a way doing an end run around the understanding phase um, by not hearing this passage as being in E flat major. And what was interesting uh, was that I was actually able to play this, this little measure for a student. I said, could you sing this back for me uh, on syllables? And sure enough, one of those two students went do, ti, la, so, la, re, fa, mi, um, showing that they, if they had not done this as a pitch matching test, they would have spent time uh, understanding the, the scale degree functions of what they were hearing. Um, so for these and various reasons, you can see the importance of dictation as being distinct from transcription. Transcription is important, but dictation is important as well. Transcription is not a substitute for dictation, but a separate activity uh, in its own right. Transcription and other asynchronous activities can be administered remotely, but not without difficulties. Most problems uh, occur with audio fidelity. So for example, frequency response, what's being transmitted and what students are actually hearing with their own uh, equipment. So for example, the, the bass register, uh, which is especially important for taking harmonic dictation, but really for anything uh, in, um, in, in the bass clef. And uh, overtones, it turns out that overtones are, are quite important for some listeners for, for perceiving pitch well. Uh, and that's a topic we could get into, but I actually had a student once who had hearing loss in the high register, uh, and she had a great deal of difficulty with, with pitch memory because of that. And, and um, uh, some um, uh, listening devices actually helped her with that. She had to relearn how to hear. Uh, and just distortion in general, both harmonic and non-harmonic distortion can cause problems. Um, so that's what can cause some difficulty for students doing this work remotely if the equipment that they have uh, doesn't produce very good audio fidelity. And dictation and other real-time activities like error detection can also be administered remotely with everybody meeting, say, via video conference. Uh, but there are even more difficulties involved. Certainly the same problems that you see there on the screen um, having to do with transcription can cause uh, problems with, with dictation but also uh, problems with video conferencing software. Uh, so for example, latency or, or lag can cause some problems. More, more significantly, dropouts, um, artifacts of sound. I was working with Zoom and hearing sight singing in this past spring, and some of the students, their Zoom connection was giving me very strange artifacts. So I was hearing uh, overtones, including very prominent fifths that were going along with, with students singing. Well, if that's happening with dictation, that can really cause problems. And then, of course, freezing. Um, you know, at any time the, the, the uh, uh, signal can freeze, and that can cause some uh, impossible difficulties for students taking dictation. Um, beyond that, there's also the time to submit responses. Uh, if we really wanted to try to uh, replicate the kind of dictation real-time uh, tasks that we have in the classroom, uh, then there should be a time limit. Students might have only a few minutes to finish up their work and then submit it online, but they'll have to scan it or photograph it. Uh, then they'll have to be able to upload those images. They'll have to rely on servers, both on their end and on my end. Uh, and then whatever kinds of transmission difficulties there might uh, be in between. And so those are some real problems that can occur in um, asking students to do dictation in real time. So instructors and students both need uh, adequate equipment. Let's talk about instructors first. Um, they need to be able to create and deliver content for assessing and evaluating student work. 
So they'll need audio recording or streaming equipment, especially a good microphone. Uh, they'll need audio editing software. I highly recommend Audacity. It's free. Everyone can, can work with it. I used Audacity for mastering all the audio for my uh, manual for ear training and sight singing. It works very well. Um, they need a, a printer and scanner or PDF editing software. And I've become a convert to using uh, GoodNotes on an iPad now. Uh, it's working very well for editing uh, students' work. Um, and then um, they'll need video conferencing software, Zoom, Skype, or whatever in order to do this. But there are difficulties with this. So Zoom, for example, by default, Zoom cuts off audio above 8,000 hertz. So look at the right-hand arrow there. This is a sonograph from uh, a Zoom signal. And everything by default in Zoom is cutting off above 8,000 hertz. And if you look at the arrow on the left, you see that it also ramps off audio starting at around 200 hertz and below, which is right in the middle of the, the bass clef staff. Um, and this can be a problem uh, for students uh, doing dictation work and listening work. And so there is a solution for this, and that is to get into the settings for Zoom. So here it is in Mac OS. It's, it's I think, quite similar in, on, on the PC side. Um, but what you need to do is go into the settings and then the audio panel uh, and then click advanced. And then there's this checkbox here to show in meeting option for enable original sound. And once you're in a meeting, um, then there will be a selection at the top of the screen. You can say enable original sound. And what that does is uh, compare this. Here's the, the uh, processed sound at the beginning. And then here it is with so-called original sound. And you can see that it's much flatter uh, in the bass register and it doesn't ramp off at, at 8,000 hertz, but more uh, maybe up around 16,000 or so, which if your ears are like mine at age 62, you can't hear up there anyway. Um, and, and so that's really uh, quite helpful for, for students to improve that audio. And it's a little thing that, that, that uh, you just need to know to do. And if you're using some other software like Skype or something, you'll have to see how they handle uh, audio as well. Now, students also have to have adequate equipment and environment for doing uh, their work. As far as the equipment is concerned, they need a laptop or a tablet or a phone at the very least, a smartphone. Um, then they'll need either a scanner or a smartphone with uh, a decent resolution camera uh, or a tablet. Uh, and then they'll need reliable high-speed internet service. And for some students, this is a, a difficulty. Um, they also need good speakers or headphones with wide frequency response range, not earbuds. Um, I really strongly recommend against earbuds. Now here is one of the better pairs of ear, earbuds that are uh, on the market, uh, Apple's EarPods. Uh, and this is the frequency response. And you'll notice how it rolls off uh, on the bass end, the mid bass and the low bass. Uh, and, and that's a bit problematic. And these are good ear, earbuds. Uh, there are loads of lousy ones out there and the, the sound quality is, is just terrible. So compare this graph. Um, I'll show you in just a moment uh, uh, the graph for a pair of $15 headphones that I just found randomly online uh, made by Sony. And the response here is, is much flatter uh, across the uh, audible register and particularly in that low range. And, and so that's really important for students to have some kind of uh, decent audio equipment, either speakers, uh, uh, satellite subwoofer combination or, or good headphones that can re reproduce stuff down into the low register. But they also need a, a good environment for doing their work. Uh, they need distraction-free area to do it, and that's difficult in, in these times. Just to give you a couple of examples, I had uh, students this past spring, once we went to remote learning, um, Abby, a single mother who was living in what looked like a one-room apartment, um, uh, with her young daughter and um, all the work that she did and every time that I met her to hear sight singing and when she was doing uh, dictation and transcription work, um, her daughter was in the room with her and, and she was you know, being a good mom, um, but that's difficult. Uh, and uh, another example might be Elijah, uh, a student of mine who went home to a large family farm and both his parents are healthcare workers. Um, there was an awful lot of stress in that environment. And, and so with all of this in mind, I, I just think that it's important that we remain flexible in delivering the listening tasks that we're asking students to do uh, remotely. Uh, we need to be prepared to assist students 
uh, who have pre-existing difficulties even before they enter in on this process and to accommodate students who encounter difficulties uh, that might be unforeseen um, as these things come up. Finally, let me just say, um, all of you, you, you have my sympathy and uh, my solidarity in this. And I think that it's important for us to think about the pedagogy and to think about the students and do the best we can and make the most of this. So thank you. That, that's my presentation. I appreciate your time. I think you're still muted. Thank you so much. I was thanking Janine and Gary for their wonderful presentations, which are full of fantastic resources and ideas um, and just, just fantastic things to think about. We've got a number of questions coming into the Q&A. I'll try to go quickly to get as many of these in as possible. Um, our team has curated a number of these on the back end, and so I may kind of clump them together and, and ask you to, as, as quickly as we can to go through these. Um, there were a number of questions about um, sort of general matters. Um, how can we make use of automated, autom automated tools to give feedback and cut down on teacher time? And how much time did you dedicate to one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings with students? Either of you, Jenny or Gary. Well, I can talk about the, the second part of that, the, the, uh, the time devoted to meeting with students. Um, once I moved oral skills uh, online uh, after the middle of March, um, my wife didn't see me for a few months. Um, that's just how it worked out. Um, and and uh, although I had 40 oral skills students uh, under, under, under me, uh, I would say that probably about a dozen of them were looking for extra help along the way. And, um, you know, each meeting could end up taking a half an hour or more. It is just more logistics, more time. Um, and so, but that worked very well. Um, the, the, the meetings with the students over Zoom, I don't felt that, I don't feel that I missed any of the uh, diagnostic tools that I had been working with or any of the kinds of drills that I had been recommending for students to work with. Um, I don't think any of that suffered from, from moving online. And I'll just add, I'm, I'm grateful to, um, you know, the opportunity for the opportunity to have, you know, graduate assistants and other tutors. Um, uh, the Society of Music Theory also has a, um, a, a place that you can go and get tutoring. Um, I think Gina Brute might um, be putting that together still. Um, so there, there are some really great resources that you can refer students to also. Thank you both. Do either of you have a quote, good rubric, end quote, for grading sight singing videos or singing videos? Um, I put one in the chat. It's just, um, it's what I've used for years. So if my videos are four points each, um, an error of pitch um, or rhythm is, an, is a, a point two ding. Um, errors in syllables and conducting are a point one ding with a max of, of minus point five. Um, so it's just something that I've always used um, and I think it works. So like two and a half big errors equals an A minus. Um, so it, it's just something I've, I've kind of, I've used. Um, but I, you know, maybe in the fall I might move that around. I'm not sure. Gary, how do you handle that? Now it's my turn to tell you that you're muted, sir. <laughs> Um, it's interesting that you asked that. I've spent an awful lot of time uh, over the years thinking about and writing about uh, assessing and evaluating uh, dictation. Uh, and that's something that uh, is near and dear to my heart. And, and I actually have become quite comfortable with, with the approach that I have for that. But for sight singing, um, that's a different story. And the, and the idea of having a specific rubric and you know, putting a point system, a kind of uh, um, AP music theory, you know, kind of approach to that, uh, I've always been a little hesitant with. And, and when I start working with my uh, TAs uh, in, in the fall semester every year, I tell them to think about it this way. Think about A, B, and zero. Um, and A, student did it great. It was fine. B, there were problems, but the student was able to fix it. There was nothing fundamentally wrong that they, they couldn't correct. 
uh, and that's a B, and otherwise it's a zero. Uh, not an F, but, but a zero, and that means that the student needs to then go and work on that material and, and come back and represent represent themselves uh, to try it again. Uh, and that's worked pretty well for me. The only downside of that is that then you end up with an awful lot of A's and B's you know, over time, uh, and there's not a big spread. What would a D mean in sight singing anyway? Um, but that, that, that has worked pretty well for me. It's not nearly as, as technical and scientific as the stuff that I've done with, with dictation, um, but I find it's very successful and it keeps students in the game. Thank you. There was a question, Dr. Kapinski, specifically for you, and that is what books are you using at UMass right now? Um, actually, right now in written theory, um, we've gone over to um, using a lot of homegrown material, which I find very interesting. Um, we had used a few different texts, in, including Steve Leitz's um, uh, Harmony text. Um, but uh, I think the, the folks that have been doing the written theory stuff are really, they like to you know, produce a lot of their own stuff. And of course, for, for ear training sight singing, we're using my manual and, and anthology. Thank you. And Janine, what are you using at this point? Uh, we use the Roger Zotman site, book for sight singing. Wonderful, thank you. Um, there, were, there have been a number of questions in the chat around uh, notation. Um, and so I would love to hear your thoughts on note flight versus muse. That's for you, Janine. <laughs> oh. Uh, well, I like note flight. Um, the note flight learn suite because it integrates with the LMS. So you can give assignments right there. Um, and um, there's LTI integration. And so whatever you're giving in, in note flight, you can give a score and it goes directly into your Blackboard grade book. Uh, but truthfully, because, um, because I teach um, ear training um, and I have students notate like when we're doing dictations, they're notating on, on hard, on real paper. And then they're taking a cell phone picture of what they did and they upload that. So I think of dictation as an art, right? Like of, of how to notate something in a, in a quick way um, and to express yourself. And so I actually don't use um, NoteFlight or MuseScore. I just wanna say one, one thing about that. There was a study done decades ago, IBM started this thing called uh, Writing to Read, and they gave kindergartners uh, keyboards, typewriter keyboards, uh, to work on, uh, rather than having them sit down and write their letters. And, and uh, the students did learn to read uh, more quickly, uh, but they were not very good at forming letters. And I think the same thing happens with music notation. If we use uh, software, uh, it's already putting the clefs and the key signatures and things in all the right places. Uh, and it's really quite surprising to see students who have been looking at music for, for sometimes many years, uh, not know what order the clefs and the key signature and the meter signs come in and all kinds of other little aspects of notation. Um, as many of you probably learned, there's nothing like writing out music to learn the mechanics of, of uh, music notation. Thank you. There have been questions in the chat around uh, motivating students. Um, how, how do you both motivate students to prepare singing assignments in advance and improve their execution? And has the pandemic seemed to affect any of that? Well, uh, I have become a big fan of students singing in front of other people. Um, so for me, uh, students singing uh, and making a recording themselves and then submitting that, not as much of a big fan of that. Uh, musicians are people who do things in front of other people and having to do things in real time under pressure is just part of, of what we do. Uh, and so um, because of that, uh, one of the motivational factors in my classes for sight singing or, or singing prepared material for that matter uh, is that they know that they'll have to sing in front of their peers. And when that went away uh, this spring, I thought the students were going to be thrilled. I was like, oh, this is great. I don't have to do this anymore. But I got on, on uh, course evaluations at the end of the semester a number of students saying, oh, it was such a shame that we didn't have to sing in front of uh, people anymore because I got really nervous when I had to do my singing final and you know, that kind of thing. So uh, to me, I think that's important. Musicians 
we ply our craft in real time in front of other humans, and I think that that's just something that we need to do. And so uh, w this fall, I will actually end up um, having Zoom meetings where students are sightseeing in front of one another. How often do you plan to meet synchronously with your students, either of you, this coming year? We've talked a lot about a, a lot of asynchronous uh, techniques here, but are there plans in place for that synchronous meeting? Um, I will say, frankly, I, I don't know yet. Um, I, I do plan on um, meeting with students at least, you know, my classes are every day, right? So um, I plan to meet students at least once a week to introduce content, a, a check-in. Um, I'm not sure beyond that. Um, I think I'm sort of in a holding pattern waiting to hear what's happening in, with the world and, you know, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm pretty much in the same same boat. Uh, I, one thing I think I'm going to try to do is to do everything remotely just because um, UMass is big and there's an awful lot of students coming and going. And if we can do all of this remotely, just for everyone's health involved, I think it'll be better. But if, for example, we encounter an awful lot of technical problems with uh, students receiving you know, dictation audio, for example, and that doesn't work out, they're going to have to come into campus for for certain uh, meetings. There's still a lot of big questions around fall for all of us, aren't there? I think every single person on this participant list would probably say the same thing. So, um, and I I regret that I I'm not sure we're going to get answers anytime soon. Exactly, it's still a work in progress in many ways. There are a, a number of additional questions around tech, and so. Um, I would ask if you know of any, or do you use any automated tools to give feedback and cut down on teacher time? Um, and, and if so, what are those? Yeah, I mean, I, I use Smart Music, um, which is where you can um, upload a melody and students sing right into their um, Chrome browser and receive an automatic grade. I don't have it worth a lot of points in their overall, um, in their overall grade because it is automated. Um, but that is something that I think is important for students to receive immediate feedback. And Gary, are you using any tools like that as well? Uh, yeah, but we're still feeling our way out with an awful lot of it. Okay, great. Um, on, on the second multi-part singing assignment idea, and I think this was yours, Gary, would they be wearing earbuds when recording their singing of part A while listening to themselves singing part B, or would they record part B while listening to it along with themselves singing part A? Yes, yeah, so no, no earbuds. They would just, they would record themselves singing great, and then they would press play on their phone so you could hear that playing while recording on their computer so that I could hear both parts at the same time. Okay, terrific, that's helpful. Another question around Aurelia and from Rising Software. Have either of you used it and what can you tell us about it? Go ahead, Janine. I haven't adopted it formally. I think there's really a lot of great things about um, Aurelia. Um, I haven't looked so much into Musician just because I teach your training. Um, I think Aurelia has a lot of really great tools, especially for dictation and that kind of thing. Um, I personally have only not adopted it just because I was looking for something. I believe that Aurelia, um, when you try to, when you're trying to sight sing something, um, there's no rhythm to it, although that could be different now and it, it, um, it may um, be able to grade someone singing a melody and not just like all whole notes. So that's the only reason why I didn't adopt it um, thus far. Thank you, Janine. Do either of you have any suggestions for mimicking dictation assignments other than using a synchronous Zoom call? Perhaps ways to post audio but limit how many times the file can be played? So if there are all of these, so I'll stop there and ask you those questions for dictation. And the answer is yes. Uh, learning management systems will allow you to do just that kind of thing. They will limit the amount of time. Uh, and the number of times that something can be heard. But of course, students can get around this. I mean, I, I hate to always think about the worst case scenario when it comes to human nature, but there are things that they could do where they could just simply record it with their phone uh, and then play it back. And so, you know, if you have, say, a, a five minute limit on a, a short melodic dictation, um, 
it won't completely eliminate the repeated listenings and the stopping and starting that I was talking about before, um, but um, you, can, you can get pretty close to it by posting a sound file that way. Thank you. Um, I do not see an option on noteflight.com for doing quote form and analysis end quote within a score. For example, a short piece to be analyzed by students for harmonic analysis, phrasing, etc. Basically, a PDF score analysis to be annotated by students. Any suggestions on how to modify that for this environment? That's also a kind of thing I think that something like GoodNotes would really uh, work well for. Um, and, and as I understand it now, um, uh, Apple is planning on incorporating this kind of markup into the uh, newest iOS, which will be out this fall, so we might not be able to take advantage of it. If it's you know, released September 1st, maybe September 20th, maybe not. Um, but um, to actually you know, mark up a score uh, on, on an iPad, um, that, that's really a, a very, very powerful tool for students. Thank you. Um, how do either of you handle musical instruments, keyboards in particular, and varied student access to them? There was another question at some point in the chat around USB keyboards um, and the use of those. Um, how, are, how might you utilize those in, in your situations? We simply can't require it. Um, all our students, you know, dispersed uh, at spring break and they ended up in such varied circumstances that I simply had to give up on any uh, keyboard requirement which is a shame for me um, because and for them uh, because they were really getting an awful lot of benefit out of the integrated work that they were doing with you know harmonic progressions and so on at the keyboard but we just simply had to do away with it as a requirement. Janine? Um, yeah, I, um, I think I mentioned at one point when I, um, one of my dreams for the fall, um, if we are online, is to ask students to, maybe they don't have a keyboard, but maybe they'll have their, presumably they'll have their instruments so they could record themselves on their instrument and then sort of overdub themselves, solfege something. So it's actually something that I had not really done a lot of. I've done um, you know, play and sings and that kind of thing, but I'm kind of excited to try something new uh, for this semester or semesters online, if that may be. Another question for you, Janine, can you tell us more about including conducting in the assessment of singing assignments? Some students have a hard time conducting while singing. I'm thinking back to my own experiences. <laughs> Uh, they do, um, but it's it's so important, you know, to to feel that beat, you know, it doesn't stop. <laughs> So, um, well, sometimes it stops, but not in my stuff. So, you know, they just having them sort of internalize and, and, and pulse and feel that beat, I think is so crucial. So I do have it um, as a factor of the grading in my, in the video assignments. Let me add two things about that. Um, one thing that conducting does, that simply tapping a foot or swaying the body doesn't, uh, is that it, it uh, actually expresses and also infuses uh, multiple levels of pulse, right? Because you have downbeats on the one hand, and then you have, you have all the other pulses. Um, and, and that's very different from just simply clapping or tapping and, and so on. Uh, and then the other thing that, that conducting does, well, our, my students, they're required to conduct with everything that they sing that's in a meter from, from day one. Uh, and it becomes second nature to them. It's harder for some than others, but they all end up doing it and they all end up be, being very natural at it a, after uh, time. That then uh, gives them an intimate sense of what the conducting patterns are so that when they're in an ensemble and they're watching a conductor, um, they're getting a sense of what think, what an upbeat is, or what where the downbeats fall and so on, that they wouldn't have had otherwise. This is an interesting question. I think many of us across the sector are thinking about when all of this passes, would you keep some of the strategies that you're using now, do you think? And, and do you think some of these might, might become enculturated into the work you do in the future? For me, I did them before, so yes. Yeah, the same thing for me. I've been doing an awful lot of work with transcriptions and things like that anyway. Um, I, you know, I've been uh, toying with technology on and off for you know the last uh, 30 years or so, 
Uh, and there are certain things that if they meet your pedagogical goals, you just want to gobble them up and start using them. And, and so being able to post recordings online on Moodle, for example, has been very, very helpful. This one made me chuckle. Movable dough or fixed dough? Oh, God. Let's start a <laughs> fist fight right now. No. <laughs> but, OK, I, I will say something about this because I've actually written a, a lot about it o over the years. Um, both fixed solmization and functional solmization, right? So fixed dough, movable dough, for example, uh, are important. Um, it, it, you, students need to be able to have some way to name the lines and spaces for things like clef reading and transposition, for example, and that's where fixed training really uh, comes into play. Don't ever think that uh, singing in fixed O is going to teach you absolute pitch. Uh, there's all kinds of research showing that there's a critical learning period for that, and by the time students get to us in college, it's too late. Uh, but it can certainly teach note reading and note aiming and so on. Um, and so then you also need something movable, numbers or movable dough, to get at naming the scale degrees. And you need to marry two kinds of systems. And I'll just give you two examples. One that you use at the university to get at the scale degrees, letter names uh, to get at the names of the lines and spaces. But you could also use uh, numbers and fixed dough if you wanted to. What you don't want to do is to try to combine both movable dough and fixed dough where the syllables are uh, having two different meanings within the same class. Thank you, Gary. Um, we are starting to run out of time. I wanted to just give you both a second to um, give us any advice you might have as ear training and oral skills instructors all over this country and abroad are preparing their courses for next semester. Um, what, what words of wisdom would you give to, to people in the field as they're starting to think through all of the wonderful recommendations you gave today and, and how they reach students in the coming weeks and months ahead? I'll speak. Briefly to give Gary, uh, Dr. Karpinski, the last word. Um, I personally just wrote down what mattered to me. And I made a short list of what matters to me. And I try to be faithful to that list in how I'm expressing myself in the online environment. And I would say that you should start with what are your pedagogical goals? What is it, what is it important for musicians in general to know and these students uh, to be able to do? Uh, start with that, think of the pedagogy, think of the students, uh, and then look for ways in order to achieve those goals. What do you think have been your biggest successes in this? And what, have, and what has been just a big, have you had any kind of just big mistakes that you've made? It's okay to acknowledge. <laughs> Um, I, I'd say probably my biggest mistake was uh, it, it, during spring break when uh, UMass announced that, that we weren't returning, uh, I sent out a message to all my students that just simply said, okay, no more dictation. <laughs> Do a little dance now, you know, and be ha happy about that. And then I had to kind of reel that back in a little bit. Um, um, but uh, I, I'd say, you know, as far as the biggest success is, is concerned, it's stuff that I was already implementing before COVID came around. Uh, and doing an awful lot more work with transcription activities so students were ending up taking sounds and turning them into notation and not just getting little pitches and rhythms right, but adding in phrasing and dynamics and performing indications and, and so on, um, harmonic analysis of what they were hearing. And, and uh, many of my students were getting some really sophisticated results out of that. I've been very happy with it. Great. So we are basically out of time. I, I want to thank both Dr. Brown and Dr. Karpinski for their absolutely informative and insightful um, presentations today. I, I regret that we couldn't get to absolutely all of the questions, but know that the slides with the contact information for, for both of these fine pedagogues will be available on the Peabody Keep Teaching website in just a couple of days. I also want to thank Joseph Montcalm, Christina Mansior, Patrick Wallen, and Adam Scalici for their support today. They helped me curate all of your questions and keep the Q&A moving forward. Finally, as a reminder, these sessions will continue to occur live every Tuesday at noon Eastern time through the end of July. A full list of sessions, upcoming presentations, and previous sessions are all available on the Peabody Keep Teaching website. 
Following the session today, you should know that a brief survey should pop up in your browser. We look forward to your feedback and recommendations for future sessions, and we hope you'll consider continuing, continuing to tune in again. Stay well and enjoy the remainder of your day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.